Well, everyone, my watch has ended. The season finale answered most of our questions. I'm still not sure what was up with the elephant. And as always, it contained plenty of Easter eggs and callbacks to the original comic. We're going to look at all of the show's themes and ask how well all this came together in the end. Nothing ever ends. This is Screen Crush. The show's title opens with a film slate with the finale's air date. The opening scene is Adrian recording the message to Robert Redford that we saw in episode 5. During the message, someone coughs and they start again. This is a clever way to show this is all just theater, just a show he's putting on. Both the squid monster and his speech to Redford are planned and rehearsed and not spontaneous events. Now, the idea of a spontaneous event being rehearsed will come into play at the end of the episode in the Dreamland Theater. One of his servants is beyond Lady True's mother. When she enters Veidt's office, we see action figures on his desk and the same computer he used in the Watchmen comic book. The directory she accesses is called Untie Knot. This is a reference to the Gordian Knot, the unsolvable puzzle that Alexander the Great solved by cutting it in two. Alexander the Great was Veidt's idol. He even said this was the only human he ever felt kinship for. And when the Squid Monster ruse was completed, he celebrates in front of a picture of Alexander cutting through the knot. His password is Ramses II, just like it was in the comics. This was the other name of the pharaoh Ozymandias who inspired Veidt's superhero name. It's actually a pretty obvious password. It's the kind that the IT guy would write down in a post-it for you to change later, but Vite was too busy committing genocide to bother. Lady True is created from sperm sample 2346. Now, I'm wondering if this is a reference to Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Later in the episode, a man who is God made flesh dies for the sins of humanity while a crucified Jesus looks on. And like Christ, John knew his death was predetermined and didn't try to stop it. Because I don't want to be alone when I die. So why did Beyond do this? Well, we know from her clone's memories that she had a miserable life. I was in a village. Men came and burned it, and then they made us walk probably at the hands of American soldiers in the war. While she's inseminating herself, she's quoting the words of the historical Lady True. She was the Vietnamese Joan of Arc who resisted the invasion of the Wu army, just like Beyond resisted the invasion of the American army. Now we know from the PDpedia that Beyond was a genius in her own right and gave Lady True a very strict upbringing, like how Sarah Connor raised John. So she planned on her daughter avenging all of Vietnam and basically conquering the world. The title of the episode is See How They Fly. Now this is a lyric from I Am The Walrus, a song that is about mocking pretentious artists and critics who look into a work of art for deeper meaning. So I'm kind of taking this personally. Its lyrics, like the Watchmen TV show, draw from lots of different sources. Bob Dylan, King Lear, Alice in Wonderland, nursery rhymes, and the tune is set to the rhythm of police sirens, just like Watchmen is about the lives of police officers. But what are they trying to say by making this the title of the episode? Maybe that we shouldn't overanalyze? There's another reason that I'll go into later. The painting fades from would-be conqueror Alexander the Great to would-be conqueror Lady True. When she walks through the Antarctic, her mask looks kind of like the trunk of a white elephant, like her namesake rode into battle. Now she knows Adrian Veidt well because she gives him the one thing that he can never have, credit for saving humanity. A giant alien squid to save off nuclear holocaust. And no one even gives you credit for it. When bemoaning Redford, he says, As if some cowboy actor could attain the presidency. Which is exactly what happened in real life when Ronald Reagan was elected. When True mentions Europa, the piece Claire de Lune begins to play. Now this piece is based on a poem of the same name. In French, the title means Moonlight. This is the same piece that played when Veidt stepped onto Europa in episode 5. In episode 8, the piece Blue Danube is prominent to a liquid creation engine as it is in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Here's a reference that one of our commenters, Mike Carson, pointed out. In the book series 2001 is based on, Jupiter is eventually ignited into a sun and life is created on Europa. Another commenter, Star F the Great, pointed out that Europa was also a Phoenician princess who Zeus had relations with, as Angela referenced in episode eight. Is this a Zeus thing? Now that's important because in this episode, Beyond is essentially impregnating herself with a super baby. Blue Danube is also playing when Lady True's ship lands to pick Veidt up. Veidt catches a bullet like he did in the final final issue of Watchmen. Then we get the reveal that the game warden was actually acting on Veidt's behalf to give him an adversary. Everything, even the trial and imprisonment, were to keep him occupied. Veidt creating an imaginary adversary is the same trick he pulled on Russia and the United States in the comic. All of this is very in character for Veidt. As he mentions earlier in the episode, he gave away his parents' fortune just so we could start from nothing. He tells the game warden, Those masks make men cruel. 
And right there, you have the major theme of this TV show and the comic. Joe Keene Jr. wanted the police to wear masks so people wouldn't trust them to make it seem like they had something to hide. And wearing a mask gave the police the leeway to act however they wanted and adopt silly identities to mask their own trauma. As he left, I felt so happy for all these wonderful people in Europa. It's ironic that Veidt has spent his life trying to create a utopia. Then he actually lived on one, but hated it because he was bored. <laughs> When Lady True puts her plan into motion, she brings all of this gear to the square that's been the focal point of so many episodes. This is similar to Herald Square being visited so often in the comics and turning out to be ground zero for the squid attack. The square is also where the show began at the Dreamland Theater. Now, if you notice, now the Dreamland is where the musical Oklahoma is being staged. There's a lot of symbolism there that I'm gonna unpack in just a bit. I loved this interaction. That's a great hat. And also this. Not exactly. You could do birthday parties. <laughs> Which is funny because Veidt's been throwing birthday parties all season long. The vendor has an interesting choice of words here. It goes to 10 years ago, man's old news. That's calling back to the comic within a comic, The Black Freighter, about a murderous sailor with the best of intentions who's condemned to ride on a black ship of death. He also says, He's living with the animals like Tarzan or some shit. Now this made me smile because Veidt has twice pointed out that he's not a character in a movie serial. Or worse, some sort of Republic serial villain. And Tarzan was one of the first movie serials ever made. The newspaper headline says the GOP wants to hold off nominating a Supreme Court justice until after the election, which Mitch McConnell obviously did in real life. If you notice, there's an interesting headline here. It says, four wounded in Saigon bombing. So this shows that 50 years after becoming a state, there's still resistance in Vietnam and some people want to be an independent country. Veidt quotes the following. Israel is desolate. And her seed is no more. This is from the Man Up to Steely, an inscription by the pharaoh of the same name. The tablet was found in the Temple of Karnak, which Veidt named his Antarctic headquarters for. Then Veidt says, The end is nigh. Which was on the sign that Rorschach carried with him as Walter Kovacs. So what does this pharaoh quote mean? Now there's a lot of scholarly debate here, according to Wikipedia, but I read it as Israel has become barren because her people have become enslaved by the pharaoh. In context here, Lady True is about to ascend to godhood and essentially enslave mankind by becoming its master. And I think it's interesting that both sides here covet Dr. Manhattan's power, not just the evil white supremacists. And all of this was foreshadowed by multiple people cosplaying as Dr. Manhattan in episode eight. The episode's theme is appropriation, taking the strength or liberty of others to make yourself stronger. Though Cyclops' goal is more overtly racist. Cal is kept in a cage while several pleased white supremacists look on, mimicking a sci-fi slave auction. There's a room full of rich, racist, white elites in an abandoned retail store trying to achieve godhood while sitting inside the facade of religion. That's a lot of layers to say that these are shitty people. There's also a parallel with trust in the law from the first episode. In both scenes, white people stood in front of a fake church and demanded mob justice. They even let out rebel yells, the battle cry of the Confederacy. Let's get blue. <laughs> now one of these people is Joe Keen Sr. He is a senator who authored the Keen Act that originally outlawed masked heroes back in the 70s. Joe Jr. is wearing the same underpants as Dr. Manhattan, which look ridiculous on him. Notice the door to the chamber is yellow. Yellow is an important color in Watchmen, usually indicating something deeply ironic or hilarious. In this case, hilarious. They're able to trap John by using the lithium he created, so his source of power is also his weakness much like the Hill of Achilles or Kryptonite. When Joe tells the story of the White Knight, he says that one of the Seventh Cavalry were transported to Gila Flats, where John became Dr. Manhattan. And then John says this. All we ever see of stars are their old photographs. Which is a direct quote from Watchmen number four, which retold John's origin story. Later, he says. What's up, are you cold? I can raise the two. Which is from the same issue and. As far as I know, there is no situation in Afghanistan currently requiring my attention. Which is from issue three. And also... Pay attention. You will all return to your homes. Is from issue two. After True teleports them away, several of them throw up, just like Lori did after teleporting in Watchmen. Beyond uses magnets to pull away their guns, similar to the technology we saw at the end of episode two. Adrian and Lori's reunion is shot with both of them upside down because... In many ways, the entire world is about to turn upside down. And I don't just mean metaphorically. 
the northern hemisphere of the planet has typically conquered and ruled over the southern half. It's one of the reasons we draw north on maps up instead of down, and that most maps place Europe dead center when it should really be in the very high north. There's actually a geographically accurate map in the classroom of the first episode. True makes the white supremacists explode with the same energy burst that John used in the previous episode. She steps into her egg-shaped chamber, which is lined with mirrors. Now, mirrors and mirror images are a major part of episode five. This both mirrored Warshock's symmetrical mask and issue five of the comic, Fearful Symmetry. In that episode, it also symbolized facing the truth or hiding from it. But here, there are several mirrors to show Lady True's narcissism. She believes that she alone is worthy to have the power of a god. Also, she's in all white, like the elephant ridden by her namesake, Lady True. Then all the pieces come together as intricate as a clock. Vite is teleported back to Karnak with the one person with an intimate knowledge of Squid Falls. Mozart's Requiem is played once more with the choir singing about the guilty man being judged. Except this time, the music doesn't cut off and the chorus actually finishes with... Lady True's hand is pierced like a stigmata, mirroring the pierced hands of Christ, showing she has been touched by an event from the heavens. Angela takes refuge in the Dreamland Theater, just like her family did back in 1921. Now back then, bombs rained down from a plane. Now it's teleporting squid clones. Will and Angela are looking at the set of Oklahoma that we saw in the first episode. This Rogers and Hammerstein show was set in the Oklahoma Territory shortly before it became a state. At its heart, the show is about American optimism. The West is open, it's ours for the taking. Plenty of air and plenty of room. Plenty of room to swing a rope. Angela's kids are asleep in the bosom of the American dream inside the Dreamland Theater. In the first episode, the show is performed by an all-black cast, symbolizing that in Robert Redford's America, the future looked bright for African Americans. No, we belong to the land, and the land we belong to is grand. But underneath the sunny theater production, there was always trouble hiding. Cyclops' symbol is the OK sign where the secret eye is hiding. OK is the official state abbreviation of Oklahoma. Judd was a huge fan of the musical Oklahoma, even singing a song in the pilot. People will say we're in love. But secretly, he was a racist trying to get close to Angela to enslave her husband. Remember what he actually thought of the show. Nobody hates Oklahoma. You did. No, I thought it was great. Then why'd you tell me at intermission that their hearts weren't in it? It's significant that Oklahoma is in its closing performance. The show is over. The lies are done. You can't heal under a mask, Angela. Now Angela's left in the theater with her grandfather and their shared memories. He remembers seeing trust in the law on screen, just as optimistic a fiction as Oklahoma. But now Angela's ready to acknowledge her family's trauma and learn from it. Wounds need to have. When they pull away from the theater, one side of the street is filled with destruction and carnage, and the other is clean and pure. Now this goes back to the Watchmen's theme of symmetry and mirror images. When we face trauma, we can't cover it up with a mask. We have to deal with it, so future generations won't relive our mistakes, like the genetic trauma that was referenced in episode five. If something really bad happens to your parents, it gets locked into their DNA. Just sometimes I feel like it's never gonna end. So a couple more Easter eggs. It was nice seeing Dan's ship, Archie. And hey, check out this yellow snow speeder here. Also, Sister Knight's uniform is kept in a locker, just like Night Owl's suit. The rubble on the streets of Tulsa is splayed out in several directions, similar to Vite's squid monster. Angela, like Rorschach, interrogates people by breaking fingers. When he dies, Cal holds his head in the nearing midnight pose so often referenced in The Watchmen. And after the destruction, the only letters left on the Dreamland Theater marquee are D, R, and M for Dr. Manhattan. Will also says, You're kidding me, and I will not break in a couple which brings us around to the show's continuing use of eggs as a metaphor. Eggs represent fertility like in episode four. They're nourishing like in episode two. They are fundamentally made of different colors like we learned in episode one. They won't stay that way if just even a little bit of yolk gets mixed in with the whites. In episode eight, eggs were used to represent a metaphor for time being a flat circle. And in this episode, True constructs a mechanical egg to obtain godhood, but it's crushed. Vite steps into an egg spaceship and is frozen like a yolk. And Angela is gifted an egg that may or may not give her superpowers. Now I think it's important that the carton is yellow, but the label is blue. So yellow could mean this is a joke and she's gonna fall into the water. Or the blue represents her obtaining godhood. The chorus of I Am the Walrus provides a clue. 
when a different John, John Lennon, repeats, I am the Eggman. Now, in this case, the Eggman is Dr. Manhattan. But did he really give her powers? Or is just this a weird joke that the show's playing on us? Or is the point that now she feels empowered and she's going to change the world, with or without special abilities? If I have to read the ending literally, she gets superpowers. Her last name, Abar, is the title of a black exploitation film about the first black Superman. And Angel means messenger of God. As we've pointed out before, every episode of Watchmen begins and ends with a similar scene, just like the comic book. And this episode is no different. It begins with a woman, Beyond, appropriating the powers of a superhero, Ozymandias. And it ends with a woman, Angela, appropriating the abilities of another superhero, Dr. Manhattan. But the comic book also begins and ends with similar panels. So how about the TV show? Now, obviously, the series begins with young Will in the dreamland, and here he's in the same theater with his granddaughter. But more symbolically, it begins with young Will seeing what's possible for his people. He's glimpsing at a perfect world where there's justice for all, where one person can make a difference. In this episode, Angela's glimpsing at a similar future. She can create a better world if only she believes in herself and has the courage to take the first step. What did you think of the finale? I loved how all the pieces fit, but I thought it was a little too optimistic. I mean, come on, Adrian gets arrested, Angela gets superpowers, and all the Nazis are dead. The comic was incredibly chilling. Not only did the bad guy win, but he was kind of right in the end. The episode is wrapped up a little too neatly for me, but let me know what you think down in the comments. It's been really fun recapping this with all of you. We're going to keep it going with some character videos and further breakdowns, so until then, stay subscribed. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.